Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. This one written by Matt, read by me. I've never read it before, we're going to explore it together. Was there an advanced civilization before our own? I don't think so. I feel like we'd definitely know about that, wouldn't we? But uh, maybe we don't. Let's find out. For as long as humans have gazed up at the starry night sky, one maddeningly simple question has continued to plague us. Are we alone in the universe, or is it possible that somewhere out there in that inky black void, someone or something is looking back at us, wondering the exact same thing? I think it's very, very likely, because the universe is really, really big. And what are the odds that we are the only ones? I mean, I don't believe in aliens, as everyone knows. I don't think they've come here. I don't think the Roswell, anything like that, I think is nonsense. But do I think there are aliens out there? Almost certainly, yes. Surely, given the sheer number of galaxies in our universe and the amount of time that has passed since the Big Bang, our planet can't be the only one supporting life. To believe so at this point would be, in my opinion, extremely narrow-minded, because it is highly probable that at least a handful of planets somewhere out there are capable of hosting complex life. Many scientists agree with this opinion. However, a question that is much more contentious is whether any of these organisms possess intelligence and technology that could rival that of our own. I'm talking about beings who are capable of thinking critically, sharing ideas, utilizing tools, growing and harvesting food, advancing medicine, harnessing power, constructing communications networks and so on. At first I was like, tools, okay, well crows can do tools, but it's like, yeah, making communication networks, okay, so big brains, real big. And crows are smart, but not like us. Or maybe they are, who knows, maybe they're just waiting for their time. For reasons other than satisfying our own curiosity, we could open a dialogue with this civilization, share our collective knowledges with one another to expand our understanding of, of evolution, society, and the universe as a whole. Yeah, more likely, <laughs> more likely is it's gonna be like some Christopher Columbus sh where it's like the aliens come and it's like, hey guys, how's it going? And then we get all their diseases and they destroy us to make room for some sort of intergalactic highway or something. We could finally know if what happened on Earth, the formation of complex life, was just a fluke of nature, or perhaps there is a Star Wars-like galaxy out there with all varieties of intelligent creatures roaming about. I prefer a Star Trek-like galaxy. This is a topic that scientists and stoners alike have brought up time and time again, but there is another possibility that is equally as fascinating, yet talked about far less. Could another advanced civilization have existed right here on Earth, and we, as a species, have simply forgotten about it? While the idea may seem ludicrous at first, because we like to believe that human advancement has been largely linear, it's not as outlandish as you might think. According to the best estimates, modern humans have been around for about 200,000 years, throughout which time our ancestors' intelligence was similar, if not equal, to that of our own. <laughs> and evolution is real slow. However, only about 5,000 of those years have been documented or discovered, which means that 97.5% of our history is completely unknown to us. That's wild, isn't it? Like, you think, oh yeah, pyramids and stuff, that was a really long time ago. Oh, that's like 2.5%. That's of of history. Less, it's like 2%. Human history. Obviously, history of the universe, way bigger. But like, of humans. When considering this, is it really so hard to believe that humans may have attempted and succeeded to construct another civilization long ago that failed and has since been forgotten? I mean, kinda, yeah. Because while we only have like 97, while well, 97.5% of our history is unknown, there's like fossils of Like, you know, you go out in the countryside, there's like fossils of like trilobites, dinosaurs, from a long, long time ago. I feel like we'd know. We'd be like, oh yeah, look, there's there's fossils of like buildings and shit, or spaceships from like our previous advanced civilization, but none and nothing's ever been found like that. As anyone who's ever cooked a pancake can tell you, getting things right on the first attempt is extraordinarily difficult. So who's to say that launching a society from nothing would go any smoother the first time around? What is it with the first pancake? Because Matt's absolutely right. Whenever I make pancakes, typically I make pancakes for sun on Sundays for my family, and we all enjoy pancakes together, which is nice. And the first one is always wrong. Like, and I've got normally I cook three pancakes at once in the big pan, but the first one I always pour out and then cook and then flip over and it's always like either not cooked right or it's a bit burned or something like that because the first one is always screwed up and then all of the others are fine and then i always end up snacking on that kind of semi-burnt first one while i cook the others 
and then when I actually go to eat the others, I'm not so hungry because I've snacked on this nasty pancake. In future, I'm just going to throw it straight in the bin. I don't know why I don't do that. It's something I do with my kids' leftover dinner. Like, I'll get home from work and there'll be some leftover dinner, and I'm like, mm, I could snack on that. What I do? Throw it in the bin, because otherwise I will snack on it. And that's bad. Furthermore, there is another possibility to consider. Who says that humans were the first intelligent creatures to evolve on Earth in the first place? If we return to discussing numbers for a moment, our planet's about 4.5 billion years old, which means that modern humans didn't exist for approximately 99.996% of our planet's history. I remember that 0.004%. 97.5% we don't know about. Crazy times. During such an incomprehensively large amount of time, could another intelligent species have evolved and gone extinct before humans were even walking upright? Could another society as advanced or more advanced as our own have existed? A civilization whose cities once stood where ours now stand, but have long since turned to untraceable dust. Today we'll be looking at these two very different but very related possibilities as we try to determine if we are truly living at the pinnacle of evolutionary advancement or if those that walked the earth before us could have built societies that make our vast cities look like little more than piles of stone by comparison. And don't worry, even though this intro may sound like something pulled straight from the History Channel. <laughs> I like that the History Channel is. The History Channel is so bad and so not about history that it's just a meme at this point. We'll be referencing scientific studies that have attempted to answer this very question. Good, because that's what we do here at Decoding the Unknown. We're, we're very skeptical. We need proof. Setting the stage. To start us off, I'd like to begin by discussing the far more likely of the two scenarios posed. Could humans have successfully established themselves sometime before the earliest identified civilizations, those in Mesopotamia, ancient Egypt, and ancient India? To answer this, however, we need to first back up and provide some context for how and why those civilizations arose in the first place. We also need to discuss what it means to be a civilization, because that is, surprisingly, not as straightforward as you might assume. According to most modern archaeologists, historians, and evolutionary scientists, humans primarily survived throughout their early existence as nomadic hunter-gatherers who followed closely behind packs of large herd animals, hunting them for meat and furs while foraging for nuts, berries, and other edibles as they went. This was essential, because prior to around the year 10,000 BC, few successful forms of agriculture had been developed, which meant that staying in one place for too long would have quickly depleted their available food supply. The reason no one had got around to developing agriculture prior to this was likely due to a little-known event called the Last Glacial Period, which is often colloquially referred to as Earth's Last Ice Age. Beginning approximately 115,000 years ago, the Earth entered its last glacial period, and at one point, glaciers covered up to a third of the Earth's surface. Jesus Christ, and I complain when it's a few degrees below zero outside. This would have made any type of real advancement difficult, as humans were far too preoccupied with keeping their gonads warm to consider alternative sources of food. They also likely did not develop any tools more advanced than those used by the Neanderthals, such as scrapers and hand axes. Plus, being a hunter-gatherer is a surprisingly good way to stay alive, so there was little obvious incentive to disrupt the status quo. Yeah, I read that book. Um, is it Sapiens? Is Sapiens the book? Where it, the dude talks about, like, yeah, when people were hunting and gathering, life for most people was actually better because they ate more interesting food, they did all of this stuff, and then farms came along, and everyone just had to work on the farm, like, brutally long hours, and eat, like, boring foods, and not spend much time, like, out in the forest having fun. And it's kind of like, yeah, yeah. But it did make life a lot better for a smaller percentage of people. And in my mind, I'm just like, yeah, I'd rather live in the present day and just work really hard to be in that smaller percentage of people. <laughs> because uh, I love competition. However, as temperatures began to rise, the Earth began to change, and humans saw an opportunity to change with it. Now, despite all we know about the Earth, the cause and timeline of this temperature shift is still hotly debated in some circles. Most climate scientists believe that the change started around 20,000 years ago, when the Earth's orientation toward the Sun shifted, causing the planet's global temperature to rise around 10 degrees over the course of 8,000 years. This in turn caused the large ice sheets that cover the northern hemisphere to melt, which caused the global sea level to rise by approximately 110 meters. Most experts believe this process was very gradual, but some think it was much more sudden, and we'll revisit that in just a moment. Are we going to talk about biblical floods? I feel like we could be talking about biblical floods, couldn't we? Like, that's a massive sea level rise. As I alluded to earlier, the catalyst for humanity's advancement from nomads to urbanites was a series of major improvements to early agriculture which allowed people to finally stop roaming and establish themselves permanently in one place. This is what led to, sometime between 4000 and 3000 BC, the earliest known human civilizations forming in highly fertile areas that are now referred to as the Cradle of Civilization. 
Is this, this I think is also in that Sapiens book. I feel like I'm reading the s summary of the Sapiens book. I mean, that's probably because it's the only like big book I've read on like real ancient super history. Other than David's book, which I don't have here, but David wrote a book, um, David Baker. Uh, what's it called? The Complete History of the Universe? The Complete History of the Universe? I'm sorry, David. <laughs> Butchering this. I'm sorry. After this, it didn't take long for the earliest economic systems to form, allowing people to trade and purchase services, form effective governments, divide labor into specialized sectors, and land on the moon. I may have missed a step or two along the way there, but you get the idea. Agriculture truly changed the world. This is the type of society that I myself am talking about when I say civilization, a group of people living together in one place that are capable of governing, creating, discovering, maintaining order, and growing, not a group that stayed in one place for a season or two and then moved on. Because of how important the advent of a reliable food supply was to jump-starting this process, most scientists assume that no civilization could have arisen without it and state that evidence of such wide-scale farming would be obvious to anyone who looked. All they would need to do is search for high levels of nitrogen in the soil or where those farms are suspected of being, the discovery of which would indicate widespread use of fertilizer. This, combined with the fact that no ruins of a prehistoric civilization have been discovered, has led most people to believe that we truly are the first to progress past hunter-gatherers in any meaningful way. However, there are people who vehemently reject this conclusion as unscientific, and the man leading that charge is named Graham Hancock. Okay, are we about to find out whether Graham Hancock is a real scientist, or is he one of these, like, uh, internet scientists, or, you know, conspiracy scientists? Graham Hancock. Although he's known for many things, Graham Hancock is a writer, journalist, and independent archaeologist from Scotland. Uh oh. Independent archaeologist sounds already a bit pseudo scientific, doesn't it? From Scotland, who in the early 1990s published multiple books that questioned the official historic timeline supported by most modern archaeologists. In his early years, Graham worked for newspapers in the UK, such as The Times, The Independent, and The Guardian. The highly respected newspapers, right there. They're not tabloids. That's not like The Post or New York Post. What's it called? The celebrity one that's just like gossip. Or we have the is it the daily mirror the one that is all the sport is kind of just made up where he published articles while living in africa exploring the world and conducting his own research into earth's history uh whatever he is up to it does sound pretty fun more recently he's devoted much of his time to speaking publicly and going on various podcasts to promote his theory that a prehistoric human civilization existed and ruled over the earth during the last glacial period Sounds like sort of guest on Joe Rogan's podcast, doesn't he? <laughs> Graham doesn't claim to be a scientist, but he does believe that his work is solid and states that the only reason his research has not been accepted by mainstream archaeology is because his theories would change the way we see the world by throwing a wrench into the entire accepted timeline. Yeah, but that's not how science works. Like, scientists are highly educated, and I assume the vast majority, if someone comes along and is like, have you thought about questioning this? They'll be like, oh, that's an interesting hypothesis. Let's let's do some research because they're scientists. They're not like, I mean, I imagine there's some level of dogma, but the whole scientific method and stuff is is like a thing. This is a timeline that Graham says archaeologists are obsessed with defending to the point that they're not open to having their minds changed. Famously, archaeology is a very snobby field. So Graham's claim that archaeologists are unwilling to new, unwelcoming to new ideas is based on reality. However, his critics claim that his theories are poorly researched, unsubstantiated, and heavily biased because of his tendency to cherry-pick evidence, misrepresent that evidence, and ignore everything that does not support his claims. Basically, everything an objective scientist should not do. I mean, fine, let's say archaeology is snobby and all of the scientists are like that, but the fact is there's a lot of them. And some are going to be like, let's just look into this a little bit. And if there's anything to it, they'll join Mr. Hancock's side and be like, let's go. But they don't. Not a single one, it seems. But let's not get ahead of ourselves, because there are also many scientists who stand behind Graham. Okay, never mind. Maybe there are some archaeologists who are like, into this dude. Okay, fine. So what exactly is Graham's theory? Graham believes that humans are a species with amnesia, who have forgotten a major part of our history. Well, we haven't forgotten it, necessarily. We've just not discovered it. Didn't we say that 97.5% of human history is just not known about? But that there is both logical and physical evidence of that history present all throughout the world and throughout all societies. Okay, be interesting to see what this is. Please, go on. According to him, what archaeologists think of as the emergence of civilization was actually a re-emergence after a major cataclysmic event that wiped away almost all advancements made by humans over the centuries that preceded them. Okay, look, I'm keeping an open mind. I'm open to this, but I'm going to need something other than theory. 
Graham theorizes that this cataclysmic event was also what caused the end of the last ice age and the climate shift that scientists claim occurred slowly over the course of 8,000 years actually took place in a matter of days, maybe hours. His theory for what caused this event revolves around a comet that may have impacted the Earth's northern hemisphere near Greenland sometime around 9200 BC, causing widespread catastrophes, flooding the world, leveling entire civilizations, and killing the majority of life on Earth. This would include the megafauna such as the mammoths, mastodons, and saber-toothed tigers that roamed the Earth until around 10,000 BC. It was such a devastating event that all functioning societies virtually collapsed overnight, effectively sending humanity back to the Stone Age. Okay, fine. Seems reasonable so far. After this, it was up to the few remaining survivors of this ancient civilization to rebuild society from scratch. To do this, they spent the remainder of their lives traveling the world as nomads and sharing their knowledge with the surviving hunter-gatherer tribes, which Graham speculates would have fared much better throughout the apocalypse than the people who lived within his lost civilization. To be honest, I find this entire theory th fascinating because if proven true, it would change the way that we view early human history. However, before we examine the evidence Graham puts forth to support his theory, we should ask ourselves if the remarkably different timeline he proposes is even scientifically possible. Okay, let's definitely look into that. So far, I'm with Matt. This sounds super interesting. If it's true, it would uproot everything, and so far my mind is still open. Is it possible? Considering that Graham's entire theory revolves around a comet impacting our planet and wiping out the majority of life on Earth, questioning whether such an event could have taken place is obviously the best place to start. And the answer to this question is, surprisingly, yes. I don't... Is, it, is that so surprising? Comets have hit the Earth and caused massive disasters? Isn't that what wiped out the dinosaurs? Like, big <laughs> hit the planet and caused major problems. Several times throughout history. As it turns out, the Comet Impact Theory, as the event in question is known, is supported by the Comet Research Group, a collection of 63 scientists from 55 universities in 16 countries. Among them are real doctors of science from Dartmouth, Harvard, Stanford, the University of Buckingham, Charles University in Prague, as well as others working for NASA, ORNL, and the Institute for Isotopes and Service Chemistry. So all in all, a bunch of people with really big, big brains. In short, they are a serious and reputable group putting forth a theory that they believe is scientific plausible. To summarize this theory, this group believes that a large comet impacted the Earth approximately 12,800 years ago, jump-starting the temperature changes seen around the world at that time and putting an end to the last glacial period. This would have occurred during a time known as the Younger Dryas, and their evidence for this impact is a distinct black mat that has been discovered at multiple potential impact sites. It's comprised of traces of magnetic iron-rich spherules, glassy silica-rich spherules, spherules, spherules. I assumed tiny little sphere things, high temperature melt glass, nano diamonds, soot, and more. All of which they say is indicative of a very large, very hot impact. They used carbon dating to determine when this impact took place. Truthfully, most of the group's evidence is very scientific, complicated, and far beyond anything I'd ever be able to explain. However, thankfully, my small brain won't hinder us too severely because I've been assured that their hypothesis, while controversial, is possible. It's just not likely, which is why it's still considered a fringe theory within the scientific community. Wow, it's pretty crazy that like a, there's dozens of scientists at big name universities, and it's still like, yeah, no, no, it's, it's not widely accepted. <laughs> Plus, the comet impact theory is actually largely irrelevant to what we're discussing because the comet research group does not make definitive claims about the possibility of a prior civilization. They merely believe in the comet itself and the extinction event that followed. However, with such an event at least being possible, we can continue on knowing that Graham's theory does at least have some basis in reality. Yeah, okay, so many scientists believe this, but the majority don't. So we're starting on some foundation a fairly weak foundation though however there are many more questions that need to be answered such as could a world like the one graham describes a world where an advanced civilization exists alongside hunter gatherers be possible and if so would this hunter gatherer society really be better equipped for survival after an apocalypse than the more advanced people and the answer to this in theory again is yes even today our own modern society exists alongside modern-day hunter-gatherers who live within areas like the Amazon, Africa, and on the Andaman Islands, and our technology is far beyond anything Graham claims his lost civilization may have possessed. So, the idea that two distinctly different types of human societies could coexist is more than possible. It's actually confirmed. And the fact that a hunter-gatherer society would be better equipped for survival is not up for debate either. Most of us today are completely reliant upon the rest of society to provide our food, build our homes, supply our power, and so on. Yeah, if someone just dumped me in the forest and was like, Hey, Simon, off you go. <laughs> 
I'll be like, I'll be dead within like 20 minutes. These tribes, on the other hand, require none of this. They have largely maintained their independence and would likely have no trouble surviving without us. In fact, they might even fare much better in the long run without us around to continue inflicting damage upon the Earth's climate. And now, with that out of the way, we need to answer a question that I'm sure many of you have been asking since I first explained Graham's theory in the last section. If this civilization did exist, where are its ruins? For this, Graham offers a few different possibilities. However, one that he has put forth time and time again is that his civilization may have been built upon what is now referred to as Lost Land. For those unfamiliar, Lost Land is a section of land that existed during prehistoric times but has since disappeared due to either geological shifts, rising tides, or any other catastrophic geological phenomena such as the one that Graham proposes occurred as a result of the comet impact. Ooh, that's interesting. So it could be underwater somewhere. To make this perfectly clear, Lost Lands do exist, and scientists have found and studied many of them, such as the Bering Land Bridge, which once connected Russia to Alaska but is now fully submerged and referred to as the Bering Strait. There are also entire continents that have been lost, such as Zealandia, which was a landmass adjacent to Australia that is now 94% submerged beneath the Pacific Ocean. Of this continent, only New Zealand remains above sea level, and very little of the once inhabitable land has been explored. That's awesome, I had no idea! S New Zealand is basically 6% of another continent. I guess everyone in New Zealand knows this, and they're like, <laughs> Yes, Simon, we know, but like, that's incredible. Here, among many other places, is where Graham expects we may find lost ruins. However, as many people have pointed out, it's very convenient for Graham to simply claim that his missing ruins are all submerged beneath the ocean, but this idea does make some amount of logical sense. After all, where do cities generally spring up? Yeah, they're by water, by the coast. Like, that's where stuff is. Or by big rivers. And if all of those just suddenly rose up, then they'd all be underwater. That makes sense. My mind remains open. After all, where do cities generally spring up? Exactly, along coasts and waterways. And what areas are now completely underwater and difficult to access because of the rising seas? Well, those very areas. This certainly doesn't prove anything, but Graham maintains that there is much to discover under the ocean and that significant resources should be allocated to underwater archaeology for further research. I kind of agree, that'd be awesome. If there's those extra resources available, let's do it. Finding one of these lost cities has been a major goal of Graham's for years because doing so would prove that humans were building permanent settlements prior Prior to the rising tides that resulted from the Younger Dryas, which, regardless of what caused that rise, was well known before those first civilizations are believed to have arisen. Gods among men. So now it's time to finally talk about some real heart hitting evidence. Although Graham has many problems with the official historic timeline, one that is central to his entire argument is his belief that the earliest confirmed civilizations seem to have arisen out of nowhere and inexplicably developed many advanced technologies and sciences at the exact same time. As an example, he often points towards the Mayans' rapid development of complex written language, impressive architecture, and use of mathematics and astronomy, saying that it's ludicrous to believe that humans made almost no progress for hundreds of thousands of years and then suddenly pieced all of that together overnight relatively speaking without any guidance mm, i'm not sure i'm not an expert historian or anything but if you looked at the last hundred years the amount of progress that humans have made compared to all of our history is insane like basically post-industrial revolution the amount of humanities of progress from humanity has just been wild it's like you have breakthroughs Furthermore, Graham also points toward the absence of any transitional technologies and says there should be some evidence of attempts and failures along the way. It said it appears as if the Mayans and many other early civilizations knew exactly what they were doing and succeeded on their first attempt, making massive technological leaps as they did so. It would be as if Alexander Graham Bell unveiled his first ever telephone, the iPhone. Honestly, uh, we've heard this in Tar Song and Dance before, but what makes Graham's claim unique is that he doesn't attribute this advancement to aliens. Good. If he did, I'd be like, forget it, out of the picture. He believes that, as we've discussed, members of his lost civilization were the guiding force. As he theorizes, all the aforementioned advancements were likely developed over the course of tens of thousands of years by his lost civilization, which he believes is a much more reasonable amount of time. Kind of with him. I mean, yeah, we have these breakthroughs, but that does seem to be a lot of stuff that came out of nowhere. After the apocalypse, this civilization then passed on much of their knowledge to later groups such as the Mayans, the Egyptians, and the Mesopotamians, so they would have a much easier time rebuilding. This is why we don't see much evidence of the expected slow, methodical development in those locations. 
As further evidence that a guiding force was involved, Graham makes several observations about these ancient civilizations that he says can only be explained by assuming his theory is correct. For instance, if what archaeologists claim is true, each of these civilizations developed independently from one another without any type of collaboration or communication, yet they all share certain cultural, social, and architectural commonalities, which Graham says indicates otherwise. For instance, how is it possible that pyramids were constructed in Egypt, Peru, Mexico, Sudan, Iraq, and more without any of these groups contacting or interacting with one another in their early years? Was a pyramid just a fun shape to build, or is there more to the story? Is there something, there's something natural about building pyramids, though, right? It's not like some genius breakthrough. I feel like people could independently come up with the idea of pyramids. People could independently come up with the idea of all sorts of crazy also, in addition to the complex way these structures were built, their location and alignment also evidences the fact that their designer possessed more knowledge than they should have had available at the time. The pyramids of Giza are aligned within one fifteenth of one percent to true north, a truly impressive achievement. According to Graham, the survivors of his lost civilization may have ordered the construction of the pyramids as a final test to ensure that each of these societies had a functioning understanding of the foundations of science, maths, astronomy, and more. Mm, now we're getting into some pretty wild speculation. This may have also been a way to leave a lasting mark on the world and not be forgotten. To prove all of this, Graham asserts that within many of these ancient cultures, legends, myths, and parables, we see many recurring stories and themes that he believes should be taken literally and examined far more closely than scientists and historians are willing to do. After all, before there was writing, word of mouth was the only way to convey history, and it's likely that most of these stories originated from real, witnessed events. The most famous example of this is the story of a global flood that killed a massive number of people, which exists in some form within the mythos of almost every single ancient culture and religion discovered. This flood, Graham believes, is the flood that resulted from the comet impact. Yeah, it does seem pretty likely that there was a massive flood, because it is written in so many like myths and you know ancient cultures and stuff. But again, pretty speculative stuff right now. However, stories of a flood do not prove that an ancient civilization existed or that any transfer of knowledge occurred. To prove this, Graham often turns to other stories, such as the legends of Quetzalcoatl. Quetzal Quetzalcoatl? Eh, who knows? In modern-day Mexico, hieroglyphics discovered inside the pyramids of Cholula depict an Aztec deity known as Quetzalcoatl the feathered serpent, bestowing wisdom upon the Aztec people. This largely aligns with beliefs of the people of that time, who often depicted uh, Quetzalcoatl, let's just call him Q, Q as the god of life, light, and wisdom, from whom all knowledge was given. They worshipped the snake-bird hybrid as a deity. However, Graham believes that Q was a member of his lost civilization, the last of a nearly extinct society trying desperately to share their knowledge with the world before dying off. They saw Q as a god, but only because his knowledge was godlike when compared to theirs. What's that? Is it Arthur C. Clarke? Any advanced? Any Su sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, so this cue's got that magic going on. Graham also points towards the origin story of an indigenous Amazonian group called the Tucano. Unlike many origin stories throughout history that usually involve a type of divine creation, such as the story of Adam and Eve, their states that their ancestors were transported to the Amazon by supernatural beings who showed them how to hunt, farm, fish, forage, and survive in their new home. These beings were very wise and intelligent, and they probably and they also provided the Takano people with a psychedelic substance to help them commune with their ancestors in the spirit world. Graham believes that these supernatural beings are the same ones that the Aztecs called Q, and the reason the Takano people were transported to a new land is because their old land was destroyed. Again, fine, very speculative. I don't know. Obviously, all of this is complete speculation. Explaining the gap. If I've not overwhelmed you with information at this point, you might have noticed there is one large glaring issue with Graham's theory that we've yet to address. If we assume that a near extinction event happened about 10,800 BC and that Graham's claims of a transfer of knowledge is true, then why do we not see evidence of post-comet civilizations until around 4,000 BC? How does Graham explain this nearly 7,000 year gap? Well, he claims that it doesn't exist. He claims that scientists have misdated the sites of many early civilizations and that many of these early sites are built upon even older sites. He often turns the Egyptian Sphinx as proof. Just before we get into that, now it's like, now I'm more skeptical because now you're saying this established history isn't true, whereas before you were kind of just like, oh, maybe it could have been like this. But now you're kind of saying that 
accepted science is wrong rather than just proposing an alternative. So that's a bit more dubious to me. According to most historians, whoever built the Sphinx must have been part of a large, stable, and reasonably advanced society. The primary evidence for this is logical. Such a massive undertaking would have required a large number of skilled laborers, all of whom would have needed to be fed, housed, and protected while they labored away for years, building what is ostensibly a giant vanity project. For a society to support such an endeavor, it would need have needed to have already developed farming, mastered both basic and advanced building techniques, understood the concept of leverage, had access to tools for carving limestone and much more. Basically, everyone, including Graham, agrees that whichever group built the Sphinx were proper big brains that lived within a thriving civilization. However, scientists say that no evidence of such a civilization exists prior to 4000 BC. This means that the Sphinx cannot be older than that. But they also say that 2500 BC is a much more reasonable date because there is evidence of a massive construction project that occurred in the area around that time. Okay, fine. Is there any better evidence that it was before that, though? Graham, however, asserts that this project was actually a renovation and points towards signs of water damage on limestone cutouts surrounding the Sphinx, which he believes indicates the original work was performed during a time when heavy rains were still occurring in the area. The last time this happened, Graham says, was prior to 5000 BC, well before 2500 or 4000 BC, but the structure could be as old as 12000 BC before the cataclysmic meteor events. Mm, I'd say that the evidence of a massive construction is more compelling than, well, there was some, like, water erosion from rain. Graham is not the only person to suggest this, as the Sphinx water erosion hypothesis was actually suggested in 1979 by Egyptologist John Anthony West and further researched in 1990 by Robert Schock, paleontologist with an interest in history and archaeology. Schock has long asserted that the erosion seen on the limestone surrounding the Sphinx cannot be explained away by wind or any other types of erosion. Wind leaves distinct horizontal bands, but the bands on the limestone are vertical, indicating only rain could have caused them. Furthermore, since I'm sure everyone is tired of talking about ancient Egypt, Graham has also found even more evidence that this gap does not exist in Asia, specifically at a site called Gunung Padang. So, let's head to the Indonesian island of Java. Here, above a village approximately four hours south of Jakarta, called Kaya Mukti, there is a long extinct volcano that is considered sacred by locals because, at its peak, there is a site known as Gunung Panang, which translates to the Mountain of Light or the Mountain of Enlightenment. The reason this area is considered sacred is because after ascending exactly 370 steps to the mountain's peak, there's an ancient site that contains tens of thousands of hexagonal volcanic slabs spread across a large open area. Although once forgotten by the locals, the site was written about in 1890 by Dutch historian Rogier Verbeek, but the site was not seriously inspected until the 1980s when it was rediscovered by local farmers who began treating it as a spiritual site. According to Graham, Archaeologists initially attempted to dismiss Ganung Padang as a natural formation because volcanic rocks can take the distinct hexagonal shape naturally without human interference. However, after more investigation, it became clear that many of the rocks were laid out in long, evenly spaced rows that resembled large rectangular rooms. While they certainly could have been naturally formed, their placement was anything but natural. Furthermore, the site was actually much larger than originally thought, as not only the summit of the mountain had been stacked with blocks, the slopes of the site had been reinforced with those same blocks, making the area cover up to 37 acres. This made it clear that the site was anything but natural, as the building techniques used to construct it were now obvious to anyone who looked. Essentially, when envisioning this site, imagine a wide, five-layer pyramid constructed from dirt and reinforced by large shards of volcanic rock. Could this pyramid-like structure be another site where Graham's lost civilization attempted to rebuild? In 1980, scientists from the Bandung Institute of Archaeology and other groups began to study and map out the area. At this point, the site was determined to have been constructed in 500 BC. However, Graham disagrees with this date, and he's not alone. Sometime around 2011, an Indonesian geologist named Danny Hillman Nata Widjaja began conducting independent research of his own. While most of the work done by other researchers had been performed above ground, Danny began excavating a section of the site that was approximately four meters deep. Here, he found artifacts that he states date back to around 5200 BC. Okay, here's something. After this, he began drilling deep into the ground, taking samples of the Earth's layers. The first few meters were consistent with the artifacts they had already discovered, but the deeper they went, 
the older the evidence became. By the time they reached the deepest depths of the site, they were finding datable materials that stretched back as far as 22,000 BC, well into the last ice age. They also discovered evidence that the rocks had been cut and indicators that some had been used as joints for stone structures that had collapsed long ago. What this indicated to Danny and Graham was that each of these rocks, all 50,000 of them, must have been shaped for construction thousands of years before archaeologists believed that humans were doing anything but roaming the earth in packs. No human remains were found at the site, which means it likely wasn't used as a burial site, but it could have been used as a ritual site. Using ground penetrating radar, Danny was also able to scan 30 meters below the surface, and this is where he discovered something else unexpected three large rectangular voids that resemble the chambers seen underneath other pyramids across the world. One was. This is pretty fascinating. Like, my open mind is now being like, really? I feel like I'm just waiting for the shoe to drop to be like, oh no, it's all natural and most scientists agree. But this is pretty wild stuff. One was at a depth of 10 meters, the next at 20, a third at 30. There could be many more, but because of the difficult location of the site, the excavation work has been put on hold. Now, the final site we'll be discussing today is one I say for last, because recently it is the site that Graham points to most often. Gebekli Tepe is a site situated atop a limestone plateau in the foothills of the Taurus Mountains in present-day Turkey. At this site, archaeologists have unearthed a series of circular T-shaped stone pillars, many of which depict animals, clothing, and other human-like features carved into them. Statues of boars, sculptures of reptiles, and animal totem poles all out, carved out of stone have also been discovered. The site is believed to have been constructed around 9,500 BC and shows signs that it was inhabited until at least 8,000 BC. To date, it is considered one of the oldest known manifestations of human-made monumental architecture, but the real kicker is that only an estimated 5% of the site has been fully excavated. Although it was first rediscovered in 1963, the significance of the site was not known until around 1994 when German archaeologist Klaus Schmidt began an excavation. Schmidt believed it was a sanctuary used by roaming hunter-gatherers, one of the earliest known examples of a human-made temple for worship. However, more recent excavations and research have shown something even more interesting. There is evidence of villages and carved channels that were likely used for rainwater harvesting, both of which would indicate that the site housed people long term. For Graham, this all but confirms his theory that there were older civilizations. However, there is much more to the story that he wants to admit. The shoe's gonna drop, isn't it? Because I'm like, dude, this Graham dude might actually be onto something. This is pretty convincing. And I can now see that the next section is titled Smashing Dreams. So I get the feeling that Matt's about to ruin this for everyone. <laughs> Because I'm like, this would be this would be a major discovery. At this point, we've come to the end of Graham's evidence, all that we'll be discussing, at least. So, where exactly does that leave us? Well, unfortunately, it's time for me to decode some unknowns and tear down all of your dreams in the process. If you haven't already figured it out, the biggest issue with Graham's theory is that there is no real legitimate evidence to support it. Yes, it's all speculation, but those rooms beneath that pyramid and stuff ah, uh, 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 but then you're like yeah they could just be naturally formed like weird sh forms in nature all the time so it's just speculation everything graham uses as evidence exists solely within scientific gaps meaning that anything science cannot explain is accepted as part of the theory while everything else is deliberately ignored this is just classic cherry picking combined with the fact that archaeology is a very complicated field with many such gaps furthermore when trying to fill these gaps graham speculates heavily and often jumps through many hoops deliberately ignoring the simple solution in preference of one that fits his narrative. For example, as we've discussed, Graham points towards water erosion on the limestone cutouts surrounding the Sphinx as proof that civilization arose in ancient Egypt sometime when rainfall was still occurring in Giza. However, he ignores the fact that no other evidence of such a society has been unearthed. There are no signs of agriculture, permanent housing, or waste that one would expect to find from that time period if a civilization had existed these things would be very hard to miss. He also ignores the fact that scientists now believe rainfall may have been occurring in Giza as late as 2200 BC. Instead of accepting this much simpler solution as to why water erosion would be present, he prefers to say that archaeologists are lying about the age of the Sphinx and have changed their story to fit their own narrative. As for the proof within ancient myths angle, Graham also picks and chooses when deciding what ancient myths to incorporate into his theory. If you recall, he loves to bring up Q, the god depicted inside the Pyramid of Cholula, but he does not address the many other explanations for who this mysterious god could be. The Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, the Mormons also believe that Q was real. 
a physical being that visited the Mesoamerican people as depicted in the hieroglyphs. However, they believed that he was actually Jesus Christ himself in disguise. <laughs> okay, Mormons, sure. Graham obviously does not believe this to be the case, but he cannot support why his own theory is superior to theirs. And this issue leads us directly into the next. As for claims that his theory is being completely ignored by mainstream archaeology, that is mostly true, but not for the reasons that Graham claims. Although he likes to elevate his own theory above the rest, Graham's prehistoric civilization theory is just one of thousands of alternate prehistoric theories put forth throughout the years by different people and groups. And among these theories, his is not even a particularly convincing one. Most archaeologists don't have the time or desire to rebut him, not because they believe he's right and could destroy their credibility, but because they consider him to be so out of touch that doing so would be pointless. Yeah, it's like, if you're a crazy person and you want to debate with someone, they're just going to be like, no, 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 not interested in doing this because it's a pointless waste of my time and I don't want to debate with every crazy person on the internet. Just go read my peer-reviewed work, please. <laughs> They don't believe he or his followers can be convinced, so most don't even try. However, there are some who do, and Graham has debated them publicly. They point out many of the issues that I've pointed out throughout this section, but Graham simply ignores them and keeps pushing his theory. Graham also relies on the word of scientists who do not follow the proper scientific method. Uh-oh. <laughs> For instance, when looking back at Ganang Padang, the site in Southeast Asia where the volcanic rocks were discovered and dated back as far as 22,000 BC, Graham relies heavily on the research of Danny Hillman Natawajaja. The problem with this is Danny's carbon dating methods are considered non-standard and he has not released his full findings for the scientific community to verify. Well, in that case, we can't take them seriously at all. If you think they're real, submit them for publication to a journal and see what the peer review process does to it. In fact, one of the reasons that his research into this site has been put on hold, allegedly, is that his research was destructive to the site and was not producing anything of scientific value. Uh-oh. Additionally, the date that Danny has provided for the site has changed dramatically over the years. Depending on what publication or person he was speaking with at the time, his interpretation of his own data has fluctuated by thousands of years, which casts serious doubt on his credibility. As for Gebekli Tepe, despite what Graham claims, there's no evidence that the site was the location of a full civilization. While the exact reason for the site's construction is unknown, the reason for its location is obvious. Because it was built on the highest point on the edge of a mountain, it overlooks a large plain that was once lush with wildlife such as sheep, goats, gazelles, and other animals. This provided the people who resided in and around the site with a source of meat, but these plains were also once packed with wild cereal such as wheat and barley. Grindstones and mortars and pestles at the site suggest that the hunter-gatherers who used the site may have used these to process the wild cereals into something edible to help supplement their diet and allow them to stay in one place without developing agriculture. Although it was assumed that hunter-gatherers never attempted to build anything similar during this time, it appears that the archaeologists were incorrect about this one thing. Even without inventing agriculture, they seem to have devoted much time and effort into building this location, which seems to serve very little purpose. Yes, but we as humans, we love building things that seem to serve very little purpose, like in the future. Like, people are going to look back at our world today and be like, God, people spent a lot of time building these cathedrals to worship the sky man, didn't they? <laughs> Why? So where does that leave us? Overall, Graham is a fantastic storyteller, which is one of the reasons he's gained the following that he has, but much of what he says is demonstrably false. He uses could have and may have far too often when speculating wildly and offers no tangible evidence. His new series on Netflix, oh Netflix, what are you doing? Don't become like the History Channel, Ancient Apocalypse, oh Netflix, attempted to convince audiences that his theory was somewhat plausible, but when you break it down to its core components, there's very little value there. The Silurians. All right, look, we've been talking about Graham's theory for so long that you may have forgotten there's a second part to today's episode. Oh, I totally had. Yeah, that's right. The idea that a non-human civilization may have existed millions of years in the past, long before humans ever evolved. So that's what we're going to spend the remainder of this episode discussing, but don't worry, it's not going to take nearly as long. As the title of this chapter suggests, the primary theory for this type of civilization is the Silurian Hypothesis. For the nerds out there like me, yes, this theory is famously named after the Silurians from the television show Doctor Who, an ancient race of lizard people who existed before humans but have gone into hibernation. Okay, in this real theory, however, there is no hibernation, and the Silurians, if they were real, are not specifically lizard people. This is just a catch-all term for a possible ancient race. You probably shouldn't have named it after something in Doctor Who then, should you? Because it just makes it seem a bit silly. 
because it is silly. According to Jan Zalasiewicz, a geologist from the University of Leicester in the UK, it is highly unlikely that if every human on Earth were to suddenly vanish this afternoon, there would be much evidence of our existence in 10 million years' time, which does give credit to this possibility. This is even true for cities and other urban areas that are highly developed, as given enough time, rain, wind, and other eroding forces would make quick work of even the largest man-made structures. Yeah, but haven't we done stuff? Like with nuclear things and decay and we've made like artificial things that will just be around forever like plastic or something <laughs> for this reason we wouldn't expect to find any ruins trash or artifacts there would likely be fossils to discover but the fossil record is sporadic and incomplete to say the least so it's not impossible to think that we may have completely missed a species or a million years along the way so hearing that an ancient race does sound possible however there are a few indicators that we would expect to see that we do not the largest of which is carbon let me explain. While there's no way to know for sure, it is safe to assume that any ancient species that evolved on Earth while having access to the same earthly elements as humans did would have advanced, technologically speaking, along similar lines. This is not to say that they would have advanced in the exact same way and order as we did, because that would be highly improbable, but it does mean that they most likely would have taken similar leaps. For instance, no civilization would have been able to develop metalworking without first harnessing the power of fire, and no modern cancer research centers would exist if not for the advent of written language. Therefore, if we are to assume this, then we could also safely assume that any species that progressed into the industrial age would have certainly had to utilize some sort of energy, and it's unlikely that they would have made the jump directly from the water wheel to the nuclear reactor. This means that, barring the possibility that there were powerful resources available to them that no longer exist today, we would likely see signs of them harvesting the same types of basic resources for power generation that we use today, such as coal and oil. But we do not. Additionally, by studying sediment layers, we would see a large spike in carbon. But again, we do not. At least, not on the scale of full industrial civilization. Another key factor for this type of civilization would be a period of rapid temperature increases that could indicate artificially caused climate change similar to the type of change seen today, albeit likely on a much greater scale. This assumption makes sense because our need for power has only grown exponentially since the onset of the Industrial Revolution less than 300 years ago, and it will likely continue to grow at a similar pace unless massive scientific breakthroughs are discovered. If this happened in the past, the energy usage would have been astronomical after just a few thousand years of industrialization, which would have caused massive and sudden temperature spikes. Truthfully, we do see many of these types of spikes happening all throughout the Earth's history, but there is simply not enough evidence to say definitively that they were caused by an industrial civilization. It's far more likely that they, like the temperature se changes seen during the Younger Dryas, were natural. However, none of this excludes the possibility that a species may have evolved to our intellectual level without ever advancing into the Industrial Revolution, so there may be evidence out there somewhere that we've yet to discover. Maybe they are the lizard people who have been seeking for so long, only time will tell. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's like, I find it it's extremely unlikely, there's no evidence for it. Is it impossible? No, because it's very hard to prove a negative. And that's kind of it. And that is that decoded. Thanks for watching. If you like this show, leave it a rating on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time.